Believe it or not, scraping away 20 minutes worth of work is absolutely part of my process. Hi, welcome back. I'm Sari Shrike, a professional painter, and today we're talking about local color versus non-local color, especially when painting in portraits. And we're also going to talk about an aspect of having a practice, which is having mantras and how that can encourage and shape not only your experience, but your actual artwork. I don't know if you've ever looked at someone's art and especially artwork that's really colorful and you've asked yourself, like, how do those artists get all those bright colors that maybe your average lay person wouldn't see in a reference photo and I want to sort of answer that so a little bit of vocabulary that I think is important to know is there's something called local color which is just the art word for the color that you actually see in front of you so if I was working digitally it would be the color where if I took the eyedropper tool and put it over whatever I was trying to paint her cheek her eye her hair that exact shade and I feel like a lot of maybe painters who are self-taught or haven't done like a deeper dive into color theory um, sometimes think that that is exactly what we're aiming for as painters and I like to think of it more as just like an initial guide point um, and the trick is every artist every painter has a different sort of leash on their local color so you know some painters use local color as like the loosest uh, suggestion <laughs> and other painters sort of pay more attention to it and use it as a starting point and then they make it warmer or cooler or more muted or more high key or you know all the different directions you can go with color and you know for me I always like to push local color pretty hard and what I mean by that is um, I start out by sort of knowing and understanding what my local color is you know perceiving it is this brown is this gray which in and of itself is a skill I think the fact that you know local color can be hard to kind of tease out because of the contextual nature of color makes it to where even just getting to where you know what the local color is is like a hard won battle but I would say that yes do the work figure out what you're looking at you know her cheek seems orange you get up close you realize it's more of a gold it's more of a you know whatever and then from there you can sort of do something with that information so if you're wanting to look hyper realistic maybe even photo realistic you're going to stay pretty true to local color another really good visual for local color is if you've ever seen posts of uh, plein air painters who are painting on like an edge of a cliff or a vista and all of a sudden you see their easel and it kind of blends in the, the painting blends into what they're looking at to the scenery and it looks seamless that is someone who has a true mastery of local color but that's not the end all be all. The minute you learn that you can sort of just use local color as a loose starting guide, the, in my opinion, the more fun you can have with it. So what I'm doing here at this point of the painting, if you can see the face looks a little bit, dare I say clownish at this point, but this is very much intentional. So yeah, I don't actually see the purple quite that extreme above the eyelid or the green in the neck or the teal color in the hair, but it's close enough um, but it's more exaggerated that I just sort of go with it and the idea is at this point I'll scrape some of that away and that of course is going to bump down how bright and colorful and saturated those color choices are and it, by doing this it mutes it a little because you're sort of mixing it with all the colors around it and it creates mud which is just to say like you know less saturated less bright colors and you know considering that my model <laughs> has a uh, you know beige peachy skin tone bumping down the saturation is going to get me closer to local color but in that first round of evaluation because I did sort of push into the more bright colors and high chroma I have these lovely undertones now that I can sort of choose to build back up because that they're already there they're just more muted now or I can sort of leave them more muted and I feel like this gives me some choices and I feel a little bit more in control of my process now, of course, this isn't to say that everyone needs to paint like this. I never give out advice I consider to be prescriptive. Somebody else might watch this and it, this feels like a mess and something they never do. That's totally fine. Everyone's different. But I like to think of this as a way to sort of get myself into a mode where I'm solving problems, which brings me to the other part of the video that I wanted to talk about. And that is like mantra... Mon <laughs> And that is mantras and um, different things to help guide you through your painting. So a mistake I feel like a lot of newer painters or painters who tend to struggle with perfectionists really run into 
I see this a lot whenever I'm teaching in person is, you know, I'll ask, you know, I don't like to just jump into someone's painting and be like, oh, fix this, fix that, fix this. I like to start, no matter the skill level, asking, hey, how's it going? How are you feeling about this painting? What are your plans? What are you doing? And a lot of times new painters don't have a plan. They're just kind of, but if I can tease something out of them, it's like, well, I just want to make a good painting. I just want to make this look right. And, and, and I understand where they're coming from. And I've certainly been there, especially as a student, but having your guiding light just be I want to do a good job I want to make this look right can be really daunting because not only when you're new is it harder to sort of have something that looks like you envision it but also that makes it to where the stakes are really high it's like a high pressure situation because what does good look like what is right is it exactly like your photo because that's really hard to do not impossible but like it's going to be a, a not super fun experience and what I like to suggest is like picking one thing or a few things to sort of play with and p posit your painting process as more of like a game that you're kind of playing with yourself you know so for me a game that I'm playing is how far can I push the local color for this to still read like a representational painting but have lots of hidden pops of color that's one of the games I'm playing. The other one that I've had for a while now that I like to sort of keep as like a goal for myself is I would say that I'm a better problem solver than painter. Okay, what does that mean? Well, in my head, I think of a painter, someone who's a good painter, as someone who can jump right into a painting, look at the reference photo, and like immediately get the colors and values right right away and the drawing and everything and I've never really identified with that <laughs> you know I've always sort of needed to kind of trick myself or be really good at troubleshooting to get my paintings to where I like them at this point that is a that's not a value statement that's not good that's not bad you know it's important that the reason why I'm putting so much emphasis on coming up with mantras and and sayings to help guide you is because once you start thinking of yourself as you know just as you know morally neutral as like your paints you know knowing how to use let's say alizarin crimson it's a great rich color it's good for warming up shadows um, but it's really translucent so using it to fill in and cover up wouldn't be very smart and it's not that alizarin crimson is a bad or a good color it's just you just have to know how to use it and i think the quicker we can sort of look at ourselves like that like okay i am a kind of painter who i have a pretty decent knack for color if i kind of make the pressure the painting process seem a little bit less high pressure and because of that then I allow myself a lot of space to experiment and use my palette knife if things get out of control so I can scrape it away I can start over and I can still maintain that looseness I recently went down a John Singer Sargent rabbit hole <laughs> who hasn't and I found out that anytime he would do a portrait it's not that he would belabor over one he would do a, a portrait maybe up to like 20 times until he got it to the the final state that he wanted and so by using the the palette knife I'm sort of inviting a little bit of that if I don't like it don't belabor it just scrape it and kind of go in fresh into my own painting because I know that that's how I best respond to and as far as problem solving as opposed to painting the reason I say problem solving is even if I make a mess of something I trust that I'll be able to figure it out and I like to play that game versus make this painting look good. To me, that's heavy, that's ambiguous, that's stressful. It has a lot of baggage. But if I think of something as like, I'm just gonna go in and solve this to my best ability, it, I can feel my shoulders lower. I can feel my jaw loosen up. And all of a sudden this goes from being a high stakes situation where I have to prove my worth as an artist to a game that's as neutral and chill as like playing Tetris, right? If you lose a game of Tetris, you don't walk around all day thinking you're a terrible person, or hopefully you don't. Just like that, if you make a painting that's just like an absolute stinker, if you tried the best you could and you played a game and you lost, then, you know, get back up the next day and play again. Don't carry around the baggage. And that's why I really think there's a lot of power in just sort of giving yourself intentional goals and reframing devices when you are painting something.